Now we're going to finish up our lecture on biology of Monera, or Kingdom Monera, by talking about the classification of these organisms. The most significant way in which these organisms are classified is based on something known as the Gram stain. The Gram stain was a stain that was invented that it turned out would separate most bacteria into one of two main groups. Those who were stained positively with the Gram stain was, were called Gram positive, and those that stained negatively with the Gram stain were called Gram negative. The violet stain was the Gram positive part of the stain, and the red saffron stain was the, sa was the negative aspect. So Gram positive organisms stained blue or violet, and Gram negative organisms stained red. And this occurs because there's a significant difference in the cell wall between the two different groups of organisms. And this difference in the cell wall leads to a difference in staining. Um, and once that has occurred, then as you can see here, this cell wall group stains with the violet, then goes through a decolorization, which removes the stain from the gram-negative group it stays with the gram positive group. Then when the saffron stain is given, there's nothing here but saffron, and here you have the blue purple uh, positive stain. And so that's what separates these two uh, main groups of organisms. So you'll hear people talk about gram positive organisms and gram negative organisms, and that's what they're talking about. And it's a major way in which organisms are divided into two groups. When we talk about the taxonomic or the classification of bacteria, there are essentially four groups that are mentioned in the book. The first group, or the gram-negative group, are also called the gracilicutes. Um, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but that's the way I'm going to pronounce it. This is just another name for uh, gram-negative, and it, it tells you something about the cell wall. Uh, and the fact that it's thin and it stains only with the red saffron stain. The gram positive have thicker group, thicker cell walls that stain positively with the crystal violet, and they're called firmicutes. The firmicutes, uh, if you think about it, you can remember that. Think thick, think positive, firmicutes, thin, negative. Gracilicute. Gracilis is a way of talking about thin. Um, but then there are two other groups that don't really fit into these two categories. The first has no cell wall and is called the tenoracutes. They basically lack a cell wall, and because they lack a cell wall, they're soft and more pliable than the other two groups. And then there's this last group that doesn't really fit into any. Uh, anything. It, they tend to be a primitive group that have been around longer than the other groups. They have unusual cell walls. They have unusual nutrition um, requirements. And they don't stain rightly with either the positive or the negative stain. Um, these are also part of the groups of those organisms that live in very unusual environments. And they're, they're called the mendosicutes. Now let's talk for a few minutes about specific organisms. Um, one organism that's kind of interesting to talk about, although fortunately does not cause problems like it used to, is Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium botulinum is a anaerobic gram-negative organism. It's rod-shaped, so it's bacillus. And it produces a toxin known as botulinum toxin or Botox. And the, this toxin is the most potent toxin that has ever been found in the universe. Very, very minute quantities of this toxin can, can kill animals and humans. 
Um, it's been said that a few teaspoons of botulinum toxin can contaminate the water supply for an entire city uh, and, and would cause death of, of the entire population. Botulism or botulinum toxin causes a, is absorbed from the intestine and causes an ascending paralysis that starts out with weakness of the eyes and um, uh, lid lag or uh, inability to keep your eyes open and facial weakness and ultimately this weakness reaches the respiratory system and it's how the people die. Another important organism to remember is, is uh, Salmonella typhirium. Uh, there's another one called just Salmonella typhi and Salmonella typhirium and also, Shigella and Aridides are two gram-negative organisms that they're also anaerobic and they cause food poisoning. Now, they, this diagram here is meant to show the organism invading the intestinal tract. Actually, it invades from this side over here, invading the intestinal tract and causing cellular damage and recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells by invading through the intestinal tract. And because of that, these cause, uh, in, these are called invasive bacteria, and they cause an invasive type of food poisoning that leads to bleeding. And the people that have this kind of food poisoning have severe bloody diarrhea. Um, and people can die from this. Um, excuse me. Now this is to be uh, differentiated from something like cholera, which is caused by an organism called Vibrio cholera. And cholera produces a toxin that damage the, damages the intestine. So it does not invade the intestine but only damage, it, it's a toxin, and because it doesn't invade the intestine, there's no bleeding involved, and so the diarrhea that's associated with cholera is not bloody. And e. coli, there are actually two different types of E. coli, that one of which invades the intestinal wall, like uh, is shown here, and then another that gives out off a toxin, like cholera, and the diarrhea, associated with that can either be bloody or not. When you go to Mexico and you develop uh, problems in Mexico, it's most commonly due to a pathogenic E. coli as opposed to Salmonella or Shigella. The, another organ, organism that's present in, in um, Mexico that we don't have much concern about here is amoeba, which can also cause a severe bleeding type situation in the intestine. Now, <clears throat> organisms that are in the same species but have different traits are called strains of organism. You notice that I talked about two different kinds of E. coli. Well, those E. coli are both in the same species, okay, but they don't act the same way. They have different traits, and so those are two strains of E. coli. You hear people talk about strains of influenza, uh, different, and those are generally separated by the kinds of molecules that are on the surface of that virus. So anyway, these are some interesting organisms that were mentioned in your book and, and that uh, we talk about. One other thing I'll say about botulinum toxin is it's, it is what is used to uh, treat wrinkles. And obviously the dose there has to be extremely small, but what it does is it paralyzes the muscles uh, in the face and flattens that, that area and, and, makes, and that's why the wrinkle goes away. Now we're gonna finish up by talking about conditions for growth and how to prevent um, bacteria from, from growing. One way to remember the conditions for growth is to remember the mnemonic fat tom, although this is a little bit different than what was in your book, and I'll go over what was in your book. First of all, you need moisture. Bacteria can resist dryness, but they flourish and grow well in moisture, and that's the M and tom. 
you need temperature, a favorable temperature. And a favorable temperature is not too hot and not too cold, sort of like uh, the Three Bears porridge. And it's somewhere between 80 degrees and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is body temperature a little bit colder than body temperature. And as you know, we put things in the refrigerator to keep them fresh. Basically, that lower temperature prevents bacterial growth, and that's what keeps it fresh. And this is the T in fat. And then there's nutrition or food. Uh, bacteria generally need a, something to grow on, food to eat. There are a few bacteria that are autotrophs that make their own food, but generally they, are, they require food. And that's the F in Fat Tom. Most bacteria favor a light, a low light situation or no light. They do not grow as well in light. This is particularly true in terms of UV or sunlight. UV or sunlight is actually a disinfectant. This is actually not in the mnemonic above. And then lastly, most bacteria that are important are aerobic, requiring oxygen. But some require no oxygen, and actually all, almost all the bacteria I mentioned in the last slide were anaerobic uh, and gas producing. Other factors that are mentioned in the slide that were not mentioned in the book include a period of time. It does take time for bacteria to grow and acidity. Uh, many bacteria are sensitive to a certain amount of acidity and actually one of the functions of gastric acid in your stomach is to kill the bacteria that you might be eating when you take in your food. So knowing this, how do we go about um, preventing infection? Well, first of all, we expose the food to high levels of temperature. So we cook our food, or we expose the food to other things that are deleterious to bacteria. Um, you'll see in many kitchens, commercial kitchens, you'll see um, UV light, um, black lights, which are UV lights, and those are there because UV light is, is a disinfectant. Another thing you can do is dehydrate the food, which is why Things like beef jerky and dried foods tend to last much longer than foods that do not that have their normal water content. This prevents growth and allows you to, to keep your food for a long period of time and then you just add water and you eat it. Everybody knows that you freeze uh, food to make it last longer and to prevent bacterial growth, but even refrigeration allows for food to last longer. It just doesn't last as long as it would if you were to freeze it. The last thing I'll mention, and this will wrap up our lectures, is pasteurization. Um, pasteurization is a process in which milk, and sometimes wine, is heated to a modest temperature, generally around 110 or 120 degrees. And this modest amount of temperature kills about 95 to 99 percent of all bacteria that might be present in the milk. This prevents the uh, bacteria from uh, growing and allows the milk to last much longer and prevents infection with bacteria from the milk. One infection that has virtually disappeared because of pasteurization is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis used to get into milk from the cow and then people would drink the milk, and in the process of drinking the milk, they would ingest the tuberculosis uh, organism, and that organism would then infect the intestine and cause severe problems. Well, pasteurization has basically uh, taken that away. The diagram we show here is how pasteurization is done. Milk is taken into an area where it is heated to, a, again, to approximately 120 to 130 degrees. It's then cooled um, and, and then out comes the pasteurized milk, which is then refrigerated and sent to the stores. So this wraps up the lectures for the fourth week and uh, I hope you enjoy it and we'll get back to you the next time.